So thanks very much for attending and jumping on with us. CV writing, when you have nothing to put on it. It's an interesting subject. And when Catherine first suggested it to me, I must admit, I felt slightly scared. Actually, I felt rather scared. But um, as I sat down and thought about it, I realised that it actually isn't that scary. Um, but there's a few bits and pieces that we need to run through. So the plan of this session is I'm hoping to give you info you can't easily find out on Google. It's up there, but it's in a load of different places. And I'm putting it right in front of you now. Answers to questions before you ask them, hopefully. If I'm not, stick them in the Q&A bit or the chat section and we'll pick them up at the end with pleasure. Five reasons why you stand out in a good way. There's probably millions why you stand out, which you probably wouldn't want to admit to, but I'll leave that to you, your family and your friends. Most of all, I want to give you the tools and the confidence that you've got this, that you, you can pull this off. So before we start, me, because I'm sure some, somebody might be wondering what I'm doing here and why, why I'm talking about it. I've had 26 years of finding people for companies that I've worked for. Um, so when we've recruited, I've written adverts, I've done interviews, I've reviewed his CVs, I've made job offers, and I've also uh, rescinded job offers as well, where things have gone wrong after the event. All a bit strange. I've spent 23 years finding people for companies and vice versa. So not only have I been working to find people for the companies I work for, I've been helping people launch their careers, continue their careers, and also achieve their business plans as employers. Um, it's very important to remember that recruitment and employment, it's a mutual thing. Also, I spent 15 years as a father. Um, so whilst it may seem, to hear me say, it's 26 years since I've done this, 23 years since I've done this. I've not only been there doing what you're looking at yourselves, but I'm also guiding my daughter through that and getting, trying to get her thinking about it. Also acknowledge that Binna's on the old man that's always there. She's, uh, she's telling me, now I don't know nothing. Um, but uh, hopefully if I'm repeating some of the stuff that your friends and, and close ones are saying, um, you'll cut them some slack in the future. As for Calibre, the company I work for, we're a recruitment agency and we specialise in construction, engineering, marketing, IT and building maintenance. So there's a whole heap of different sectors of knowledge that I've been able to draw upon here um, to bring to you today. So, before we worry too much about what a CV is and how you do one, let's talk about who, who's going to be reading it, or rather, who you really want to be reading it. There's employers, and there are enlightened employers, and these are the important ones because they're special. They recruit someone for personality and then train skills rather than look to recruit somebody who's already finished article. Yeah, that means that they're interested in developing people, but also it means that when you tell them about yourself, you don't necessarily have to say, I can do this, that, and the other that is I've gained through experience, knowing full well that you don't have that. They seek to minimize the risk of employing people at every stage. An old school way of thinking about recruiting young people or anybody in a trainee position is, if I want to have two trainees by the end of the process, I need to take on 10. So it's bring them in, see how they work out, and expect to spit out several people. That's not good because we're talking about the launch of your career and a good employer and enlightened employer recognizes that. As well as the fact that training somebody who ultimately isn't gonna be with you is a waste of time and money. I also know that someone who puts in the effort before being employed will do so afterwards because it's, uh, it's a gamble putting it in beforehand, it's a certainty afterwards. So if you're willing to work hard and make that gamble work, you're going to be a good one for them. So coming on to it, what is a CV? Let's start at the basics. It's the, loads of definitions out there. My favourite one is the slightly poetic, the journey of my life. It's quite literal as a translation of curriculum vitae. And uh, to be honest, it doesn't necessarily tell us a lot. So let's go with the more usual. It's an overview of your work experience, what, what you may or may not have. Qualifications, again, what you may or may not have. Anything else useful to a possible employer that you certainly will have. It's your key document that uh, goes to show why you are special, what makes you stand out, and why you and the reader need to meet. And that's the crucial bit, why you two need to get together. A few golden rules about one. 
Be honest. Nobody likes a liar. And you'll feel like a turkey when you're found out. Please notice that I've used the phrase when you are found out. Because generally things do come out in the wash. Might be quick, might be slow, but they do, do crop up. Features and benefits. You need to, if you talk about, I've got this feature and this, you need to say I've got this benefit. I, I, I am persistent. I bullied my parents for months into getting a dog. Shows persistence. Prove it and why it's special. Because I then walked it every day, can rain or shine. Not just for the first two days, not for the first week, but for the rest of the dog's life, or as long as you've been together. That's important to say it and qualify it. Check your spelling and grammar. It's really hard to make a spelling mistake now. First of all, the software puts up a red wiggly line. And then if you ignore the wiggly line, it'll also correct it for you. So there's no excuse for bad spelling. And there's not many excuses for bad grammar. No brush script or Times New Roman fonts. Brush script, it's hard to read. It's always been a bit cheesy. Times New Roman, it'll make you look older than I am. Very old fashioned font now. Best steer clear, stick with something more up to date or just clearer like Arial or Calibri. Be clear, be concise, be focused with everything that you put in there. Yeah. So some trade secrets. The CV may not be read by a human at first. So who on earth is going to read it? A machine's going to read it. Um, give you a daft example. A friend of mine wanted to work for B&Q. He spent about an hour and a half filling out the forms, doing all of the details. He sent them in and within four seconds, he had an auto respond to come back telling him we'd been unsuccessful. His CV had been read by a machine, which then picked out looking for keywords that he didn't achieve. It looked for key qualifications that he didn't have and it uh, quickly turned around to computer says no. That's gutting, but you can avoid that. And part of right, one of the key ways to avoid that is make sure that you put relevance in your CV, but also you don't use crazy fonts like brush script that the machine can't read. Layout is important. Just having a list of text isn't that much fun, but a few little blocks of color here and there and uh, moving things around could be really good, good for you and help it stand out, but not make it difficult. Um, or distracting for the reader. There's loads of examples of um, CV formats out there. And if you were to pop into Google or another search engine, um, CV layouts for 16 year old, you'll get some great examples. Use PDF to protect yourself. You've worked on the wording, you've worked on the layout, everything is pixel perfect. You then send it to somebody who's using different software or potentially um, working on an Apple instead of a PC or vice versa, and the whole thing gets goosed. Putting it into PDF means that um, that format will stay as it is, regardless what it's being looked at. As for the CV, write it, sleep on it, review it. When you finish, it will tend to be a, an elation of uh, I've done, got it done. Have a sleep on it, read it in the morning with clear, clear eyes and a clear head. If you think it's good, give it to an honest person and let them tell you whether it's any good or not. If you're not too sure about giving it to an honest person, you're slightly scared by that, refer it to the previous, write it, sleep on it, review it. If you've gone through that cycle a couple of times and you're still scared, give it to the honest person anyway and ask them to tell you what you've done or what you need to do. On that, standard phrases suck, especially without proof. So give you some examples, proactive, dynamic, focused. So many people put those words in their CVs, but they don't put any evidence of proof. Apart from that, if we were all as proactive, dynamic and focused as the, our CVs would like us to project, the whole world would be in a crazy old mess. That's really thinking about it. Maybe we are. Anyway, don't shoot, shoot yourself in the foot is what I'm saying. Yeah, just think about what you're doing and you won't go far wrong. So how do I write one? Quick summary of what we're going to go through. This is the actual meat of the talk. You start with the basics, and that's the things that everyone has. You talk about how you are different, what you have that others may not. And then you demonstrate your brilliance, but all the way through, keeping it clear, concise, and focused. So talk about the basics. And I'd like you to bear with me to let the end of the slide on this one, because I think I could well blow your mind. You pop your name on there, you put your location, your city or town is perfect, you don't need your exact address. 
And the reason why location is important is because you're saying, I'm in the right place for, this, for, the, for the job. If you're not in the right place, say why. What, what you do, I will relocate. I have, but you also need to minimize the risk. I have friends and family in the region. My family is relocating there. Anything which says to the employer, yeah, okay, I'm a trainee, I'm risky, but actually I'm, as a relocator, I should be higher risk, but I'm a, I'm a reasonably safe bet. You put a contact number on so that when the, the person's in, excited and wants to meet you, they can get hold of you easily. And same with an email address, but you also make, got to make sure it's a sensible one. So having burgermuncher at gmail.com could show that you're quite flippant and that you're not too, too serious about things. Or likewise, if you have a, a football alliance or a real football dislike, um, putting that in could actually alienate you from the reader, particularly if they're a passionate Manchester supporter and you've put uh, that you hate MUFC as your email address. Yeah, all you're doing with these, you're showing you in the right place or can be with reasons, you're reachable and you're a basic sense. So the mind blown bit, around 60% of the CVs that I read fail here. I kid you not. I either can't get hold of people easily. The uh, location is crazy wrong, but there's no justification for being there. Or they've missed, just missed those details altogether. So it's not rocket science to be able to get through the very first hurdle of writing a good CV. So how are you different? This is where it gets fun. You pop on your subjects and your grades, doesn't matter whether they're good or whether you feel they're bad, good, doesn't matter, matter whether you feel they're bad or what have you, pop them on. Um, you put on your subjects, any special projects that you undertook, and will come on to that in a moment, and any work experience or volunteering that you've done. Hobbies, be brief. But all the way through, you've got to ask yourself, is it relevant to the role? And is it interesting to the reader? So what makes it interesting to the reader? It's got to be relevant to the role. What makes it relevant to the role? Your research will make it relevant to the role. So you're here, you're at the festival construction, you're learning about different careers within the industry. Um, but equally, if you decide, well, actually, I've been at the festival of construction and it's not for me, I want to go into something else. The research that you'll do still stands out and stands up. You look at the projects that you did, maybe as part of business and enterprise at school, maybe as part of materials, and you relate them through to the role. What sparked your passion that led you to the festival of construction, that led you to then spend some time looking at different careers within the industry, whether it's surveying, design, architecture, um, whatever it may be. Yeah. And similarly, can you link your hobbies in to show that you've, you've got time in? Have you had any work experience? You might just think, yeah, yeah, I've just done a paper round for the last two years. So you've demonstrated that on a Saturday morning, Sunday morning, early, early enough to make sure that you're putting somebody's paper on the breakfast table for them to have with their cornflakes. You've already got yourself up and out and at them. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's gold to an employer who's looking at somebody that's never worked before, wondering whether they can actually make the effort to rock up. Key here is to become more than just another school leaver or trainee. It's to become the one that's done this. And you have something that sits in the employer's memory uh, from, the, from reading this section. Of the remaining 40% of the CVs that I read, 80% fail here. So if you think about that, on the, out of 100 CVs, I've got 40. And out of those 40, 80% fail that, at that stage. So that leaves me with about, what, eight to 10 CVs of people which are actually worth reading, who have actually made the effort to make sure that they're qualified for the job that they're apl applying for, that they actually stand the hope of uh, reaching the interview stage. That's quite, quite scary considering we're dealing with, I'm typically dealing with people that are experienced and should know whether they can do the job they're applying for or not. So moving on, demonstrate your brilliance. This isn't a specific section. This is everything that you write in there and it's how you pull it all together. What makes you special? Why are you, why are you a perfect fuller job? What makes you special? 
is the things that make you stand out that you do differently to everybody else or that you can bring to the party that no one else can. Why you were perfect for the job. How do you do it? You show what you know about the role. You checked it out. Show what you know about the company. A lot of people have a standard CV. Uh, typical header might be, I'm keen to work for an international multidisciplinary consultancy engaged on high profile projects. Okay, that's fine. So long as you're sending it to that type of organization. If you keep that CV and you send that out to numerous companies, ranging from your large international practice down to the little two, three person company around the corner that only does residential, one's going to be impressed, one's going to be distinctly, hmm, okay. So they've worked their way through the list of the big companies and they've ended up at us. Not necessarily starting off on the best of light with that one, are you? Yeah. Simply show what you know about the role. A little description about the role as you see it and relating what you do, what you know to it will, will work wonders. You're demonstrating that you're low risk because you've researched. I want to work for you because I know a bit about you. I want to work in that job because I know about that job and I've already thought about how I can fulfill it. That demonstrates low risk. It also demonstrates you're worth the investment. You're becoming more than the work person that I've received that I read that was doing a DOE got lost on export. Of the few of the CVs that I get, that would make, or many CVs that I get, of the few that remain, most manage to do that, if only because they have actually got suitability for the role that they've applied for. Yeah. So I said I'd come up with some reasons why you're special. I don't know you, I just know that uh, you're one of the participants on this. But uh, some, some of these things don't hurt to be reminded about it. No one else can do what you do in the way that you do it. What you do every day is special. And it's important that you need that you remember that, even on bad days. You've made the effort to be here and take part in this fantastic week of knowledge sharing. Catherine's been on this since the kickoff this morning. She'll be here till close of play tonight, and she's going to do it for the next five days. We hope. I'm guessing you've got plenty of coffee there. Similarly, she put a massive amount of work in to put it together for myself and all of the other speakers together. And we've all put time in to, to give what we know and what we hope will help you out. The research, this research that you're doing will help you think and present yourself differently to your peers. You've got something that nobody else has or that very few have, depending on how many are watching and carry on and watch this when it's been recorded. You've got insight into what the reader wants to hear, not just what you want to say. And the two are very similar, but you are going to be that much better at tying them up. Finally, you know to qualify your statements and the value of little things. The, the, the all time classic gag is somebody's, somebody's written that they want to do a quality assurance well, but they can't spell quality or assurance. Re really bad start, but actually it happens. So, you know, triple check. Finally, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And thank you for any questions. Um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the week. And I hope that this is useful. If there's anything else that you need from us, um, you know, just pop it up in the chat. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. That was just such a great, great example that from from someone really in the know, I think one of the challenges I know that schools face with this is people maybe who haven't written a CV for a while trying to give their advice to young people on what a CV should include but you see them all the time you see them you know every day and and knowing what an employer is going to respond to and I think one of your points there was really interesting about sort of tailoring what you say to the types of company that you're saying that with I mean do, do you have examples perhaps of companies that you work with of different sizes that maybe respond differently to different types of uh, of, of CV and, and candidates? Some and some I mean you get some companies take Arup for example um, where it's very unusual for them to take somebody on who isn't a graduate. Um, when you get other companies, um, typically small, small, medium size, where they're a lot more responsive. And the great thing about joining small, medium sized companies is that you actually get to see a lot more of the organization from the off, um, simply because 
if the boss is having a good day, that's great because they you're seeing them there, they're smiling, everything is okay. If they're busy or they're under the cosh, the office door is likely to be closed. You're aware of that. You get to, to see more of what's going on behind the, the actual business side rather than just the actual day-to-day -day side of it. Um, similarly, you, know, you get uh, manufacturing companies and uh, contractors where they tend to have very much a, a sort of commercial focus looking at the costs and the money aspects where typically your consultancies focus a lot on the service type aspects. The money is important, but they know that retaining a client for what they do and the services that they provide is about the quality of service, quality of relationship. Um, whereas with contractors, a lot of contractors get select, selected on uh, value or what's classed as value, but ultimately comes down to cost rather than the ability to provide a good job for within the, the money. Here we go. Come back, Catherine. I think you've muted yourself. Oh, no. There we go. There we go. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> Starting really well then. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go with any more technical things today. This is, uh, yeah stretching my brain um you mentioned that in some of the bullets about um personalizing and and sort of i showing your own personality in in who you are that there are guidelines there are fonts there are styles there are approved way of doing things but really to be true to yourself to actually be the person that you are rather than just trying to humor someone because actually mm -hmm. that then just makes for a really bad match if you do end up working in that company Yes, yes and no. I mean, the the things like brush script um, really, really are pretty much cast in stone, particularly as so many people look at look at the font and they want it to be easy to read, comfy on the eye. Um, they're also looking for a level of formality, something that's business like. Um, but certainly you can bring your personality through with the layout, with the colour. You can also use... Um, a lot of it's about the wording and the type of wording. You'll notice that some companies are very precise, um, almost cold with what they say because they, they're sort of aiming at a certain age group, perhaps. And then you'll get um, you know, different marketing altogether. You look at, um, say, Plusnet, uh, where they make a big point about being very Yorkshire and what are Yorkshire people known for? Not suffering fools gladly, liking to get their money's worth out of something. And it worked on it working. You know, if I, if I take a reference on somebody and uh, the referee says, yeah, they're a good lad. I know that I, there is no further question that I can ask that means anything because a good lad up here is somebody who is absolutely bombproof with liability, knows their onions. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, you just can't go wrong with them. So again, with your, your sort of language that you use, what you talk about, you can bring that through. But a lot of the time, your CV is a tool to get you through the door. So you need to sort of raise the employer's interest, um, but not necessarily answer all of their questions. A bit like a flyer for a show or something. It's a teaser. Very true. Very true. I, I know that you and I have had this conversation um, uh, as well but obviously construction as an industry not renowned for being super inclusive and and being um greeting women with with open arms particularly um and i know that there are statistics that do the rounds from time to time that say that women only respond to jobs when they meet 95 percent of the criteria in the advert men respond when they meet 60 percent and i know that you mentioned that that you think that it's probably lower than that, that people respond just because they feel like it. And actually there's something in making sure that you you are relatively selective about the, the jobs that you apply for, the ones that you think you are a good match for. Absolutely. I mean, in terms of diversity, the industry has got this image problem and they're very rare of it. And I think the big difference now as compared to sort of 10 years ago is they, they actually care. Um, before 
that the industry maybe didn't know that it had a problem and wasn't too concerned because it had enough people coming in. What they've realized now, what seems to have been a growing realization is that actually it's important because if you're designing a building that's going to be used by the whole community, you need to have the whole, you know, people that understand that community designing it. And, uh, you know, the community isn't just one particular group of people. Um, it's not, you know, the world isn't like that. Similarly, um, you know, the, the realization of uh, that diversity brings some new, fantastic and wonderful ideas. And we're also talking about age. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I need, you know, they're only interested when you've got 10 years experience. Well, not always, and not often, because yes, you need experience to be able to do a certain element of the job, but you also need to keep an open mind and, uh, and be willing to ask what might be a daft question or might actually be a crucial one. You, you need to go for it. In terms of suitability for roles, I've heard the stat about um, the difference between men and women and just going for it um, a lot of times. And I think there maybe is some truth in that. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, it's maybe a cultural thing whereby everybody needs the men, you know, men, instead of saying, yep, I can do that. I can spell the job title. It's interesting to me. And uh, other people saying, oh, no, I can't possibly go for that because I don't know anything about it. Um, you know, could, should come together a bit more. You don't need to know everything about it, but you do need to know enough about it to be able to make a judgment. And once you've done that, you put a time in on your details to say, I've learned about it. I've made the judgment. This is why I think I'm good. And I'm communicating that to you. That should get you through the door.